Well, good morning. It is great to see you guys in a world that wants to focus you on fear or anger. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Fear, anger? I want to encourage you as a believer to focus on being thankful, being grateful, regardless, because he's in charge regardless of what happens in our world, what happens around us, in the hospital, out of the hospital, home, away, here, gone, vacation, work, making cookies, Michelle, you know, all those things, he's with us. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the priorities of Jesus. We're going to look at Luke, we're going to do it in two chapters at a time now, but, so we're going to look at Luke chapter 12 and 13, and I just want to remind you, I'm going to remind you every week, and you'll get tired of it, is I have time to give you a taste of the chapters. I don't have time to go, you know, every, I mean, I could, I guess, we could take three years on the book of Luke, but... Um, I want to give you a taste of Scripture so that you can get hungry for it and uh, go after God on your own and learn how to have those disciplines of faith. So, um, I'm weird. I know that's a shocker. Gene's like, no, it's not. Um, I love when November 1st hits. I'm one of those weirdos. You may not be. And let me tell you my opinion if you come to me and say, you know, Eric, you're celebrating way too early because we don't like it, and I will say to you, so so you're out of luck if you don't like this story. But the truth is, November 1st, every year I do two things. Number one, I go and find the Publix Pilgrims. So we have the Publix Pilgrims salt and pepper shaker, got the gravy bowl, got the cups, got the stuff. So we get them out, and I put them on the table. I usually take a picture of them. If you're on Facebook with me, you can see them. It's not very exciting, but there it is, right? So so this year I did the same thing. And by the way, while I'm getting that stuff out in the background while you were sleeping is, pre- is playing, and I know that you may not like that movie, but I don't care about that either. So uh, while you were sleeping is playing in the background, which was really cool because my daughter came home from college and said, did you already watch it? And then she watched it on her own, which I thought was awesome. I'm like, oh, extra credit for ruining someone else's life. So, um, and you have to watch it again after New Year's because you know the movie ends after New Year's, so it's kind of a... Anyway, okay. So, so that's one of the things I do. So this week I get everything out. I got everything sitting there and, and um, I take everything back to the attic and, you know, put everything up and then, you know, I'm walking around and I'm like, man, where is my phone? Well, in the meantime, I, my little dog begged for a walk. So I took the dog for a walk and on the way back uh, 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 from the walk, I, I you know was not paying attention. I took him off the leash. And so he ran around and then came back in the house. It was great. And, uh, and so I'm looking around, I'm thinking, and I did what you all do, right? And how many of you had to retrace your steps after losing something, right? So I'm thinking of all the places I went and then I went, oh, this is the reason I have an Apple watch. People say, why do you have an Apple watch? Why do you need an Apple watch? Because of this. And, and let me tell you, this is so common in my house that that ding happens that my wife instantly, I will hear from across the house, it's in here. She just knows that that means, once again, her husband has lost his phone. And so I'm looking all over the house and I'm like, okay, I hear nothing. We get still. My mom at this point is out with her walker watching me. What are you doing? Wandering around the house. I'm looking for my phone. Oh. She's enjoying this. This is like the best show of the day. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe it's gotten under... Co- so I find covers and I throw covers thinking maybe it's under there. And I'm pushing the button. I think, oh, no, no. I've left it on the walk with Buster. So I go walking outside and I'm doing the ding and it says phone disconnected. I'm like, okay. So I didn't leave it in someone's yard, which I've already had, you know, imagined that what I've done is, is left it and some neighbor picked it up and is now walking around with my phone, right? I've already had all these visions of sugar plums dancing in my head, right? And so, so I go back inside, and I'm pushing the button, pushing the button, pushing the button. I'm like, where have I been? And I don't hear it, and I'm walking all over the house, and it has the find my phone feature, and it's not saying that I'm close, and I'm like, where? And the, Oh, no. So I go back to the box that's in the attic, and I open the attic door, and I... Very faintly, inside of the box, I have left my phone. (laughs) 
I want to tell you that looking for my phone was not on my to-do list. How many of you have ever lost your phone? Isn't it amazing how that was not on your to-do list, but suddenly it is the most important thing? Like, partially because you know, like at the hospital one time I actually left my phone on a dinner tray. Let me just encourage you, don't put your phone on a dinner tray at the hospital. They, they incinerated my phone, apparently. So, Brad, did you know that? Like, don't tell, that would be my advice to anybody at the hospital, don't. Put it next to the tray, not on the tray, because they'll just whisk it away, and you'll wake up from a drug-induced coma and be like, where's my phone? And then you'll hit find my phone, and it'll show the incinerator burning it, and it'll be it. But it's amazing what priorities do, and here's the thing. Listen, when something's a priority to you, all of a sudden you focus on it, you make it a big deal. And so what we're going to look at in chapter 12 and 13 here is the priorities of Jesus. And what I want you to do is I want you to make this as important as you would finding your phone. I'm going to give you three priorities that I want you to include in your life that Jesus made priorities. By the way, uh, I, I love what one of my pastor friends used to say. He used to say, I listen to what Jesus says because anybody who rose from the dead has authority. And so if you want to know about Jesus, read what he says. If you want to know who God is, you read the Bible, you spend time in what he said. So let's pick up today. We're going to talk about this idea of the priorities of Jesus. Number one, the first priority of Jesus is that we be, have preparation, that we're ready, and that we're obedient. Where did I get that from? Well, let's pick up this story in Luke chapter 12, 35 to 37. I'm skipping part of a fruit tree story, and then we'll pick it back up in 40. Here we go. Be dressed, which means put your belt on. You ever go to the store without your belt on, guys? By the way, the older I get, the more suspenders are looking good. Just, <laughs> just saying, just saying. I'm, I might be one of those suspender guys real soon. Amen. You, I, am I too much information? All right, so be dressed. My wife will watch this later and be like, why did you? Okay, never mind. So be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. By the way, you don't realize the importance of light until you lose power. Did anybody lose power during the hurricane? Right? And so you lose power. Some of you were like, nah, 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 nah. Okay, no, George, you didn't need to. Okay, but right? It's amazing how quickly you're like, where's the lamp? And once again, right, how many of you have used your phone as a flashlight? Isn't that incredible? Well, this has become like, oh, okay, anyway, this is the mark of the beast. But that's another story. All right, here we go. Sorry, sorry, don't, don't write that down. Okay, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke. Please don't make it on the internet. All right, here we go. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So he's been to the wedding banquet, he's coming home, and then it says, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. So Jesus is saying, are you ready for his return? Are you ready for his return? And then it continues, listen to this, I love this, because to me this next couple of sentences is a picture of heaven, and you've probably never thought about this. Here we go. It'll be good for those servants who the master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and wait on them. Time out. So, Lord's Supper one of the, was the Passover. One of the things about the Passover is... Uh, uh, Jews would not have a servant, even if they had a servant all the time to wash feet and everything, they would not have a servant during the Passover. Did you know that? And so they would send the servant home. The servant went home, uh, um, uh, you know, it was, unless they were Ebenezer Scrooge, they worked for, right? So the servant went home. So what did Jesus do? Jesus washed the disciples' feet, right? An example to us. Way before that, Jesus is telling a story here about the fact that in heaven, Guess who serves the food? Jesus. Isn't that awesome? You're like, but I don't deserve that. Exactly. That's the whole point. Just like the disciples even said to Jesus, don't wash my feet. And Jesus is like, unless I wash your feet. And they're like, okay, well, go ahead. Wash everything then. And then Jesus is like, no, no, it's not, we're not taking a bath here. Right? And so I love this idea. Somebody said, do you want to know what heaven's like? Look what Jesus did on earth. What did he do? He went to parties. 
He ate food. By the way, Jesus ate food with people so often that when you see Jesus on the road to Emmaus, right? He's walking with the guys. They have no idea who he is. He's explaining the Bible to him. They're paying attention. Oh, okay, okay. And then what's he do? He prays for dinner and they go, oh, that's Jesus. They had been around him so much when it was dinner time that they were like, hey, that's him. And the Bible says, and their eyes were open. All of a sudden they're like, oh, how did we miss that the whole time? Oh, that's the way he prayed. I love the idea of Jesus coming. And so what he, what's he saying? He's saying, be ready. And, and here's the thing about being ready. When you're ready, you don't have to be afraid. It's not like a roller coaster where you're ready, but you're not ready. Be ready is basically you are prepared. When the power goes out, you've got your generac ready to go. You, you don't have to fear. Why? Because you've put your faith in Christ. So all of these verses that we're going to read today are in light of this. If you have surrendered your life to Christ, if you put your faith in Christ, these are not things that you have to worry or fear, but these are part of what's going to happen. And you should be excited in the fact that one day the bridegroom will come, and not only that, he's going to serve us, which is it's like totally crazy to think that he's going to do that. But guess who said it? Jesus. And guess who I listened to? Jesus. So then Jesus tells a story about a, a tree that won't produce any fruit, and basically he's going to burn it down and kill it. And listen to what this end of this passage says. I love this. You also must be ready. So we're back to this theme of being ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not respect him. I'm sorry, the fruit tree is coming up later. Never mind, we'll get there. Gosh, that's what happens when you preach twice in a row. So you also must be ready, why? Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. You know, I get emails, I get Facebook notes, I get a video from somebody every few months. And you've been watching reels and some pastor decides that... The iPhone is, shows, demonstrates that it's the end of time. Or somebody, you know, birthed a cow with three heads, and so that shows that Jesus is coming back. And so they always try to send me this, like, Jesus is coming back, and here's what I say, you're right, and I'm ready. It might be today. It might be tomorrow. It might be next week. It may be when I'm far gone. But guess what? I'm ready. So I don't have to worry when somebody says, hey, here he is. He's coming today. I'll go, okay, great. I'm ready. And if you're prepared, it doesn't matter when he comes. That's why Jesus says to the disciples when they say, so when are you coming back? He's like, it's not for you to know the hour of the day. And then he goes on to essentially say, just do what I've called you to do. What does that mean? Be obedient. So the question is this, are you being obedient today? Are you prepared, number one, and are you being obedient? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Because here's the deal, in the light of eternity, is what you're doing today really matter? This is one of the reasons I get so excited about the kids' ministry growing. You know why? Because as the kid ministry grows, and by the way, not everybody likes that, because when your ministry grows, some people are like, well, I liked it when it was small. That happened to me years ago as a youth pastor. But I look and I realize, long after I'm gone, unless Jesus comes back, these kids will be in these places. These kids will be leading the next generation. And so in the light of eternity today, are you doing anything? Are you prepared? And are you being obedient to Christ? So here's your first challenge. Be obedient to Christ daily. Is there any area of your life that you're saying no to God? Keep that's the next slide. Is there any? There you go. You're there. Is, is there any area? Don't you hate running the thing when the pastor calls you out? It's really awful. By the way, surf ministry. You guys are doing. Is it next weekend or the weekend after? I couldn't remember. The weekend after surf ministry on Saturday morning. You can look it up if you want to know something about the surf ministry for kids. You let them know, and Keith and Beth will let you know what's going on there. So number two repentance and grace. So not only be prepared, not only be obedient, live with this idea of repentance. Why repentance? So I don't know how often you... I love this. This is one of the best picture hanger thingies there is because you can mark the back of where the holes are with this part 
and then you can put it on the wall and, and make a mark, and then you can make sure it's level. But something I know about levels from experience is I had a level that had cement on it, and I didn't know it. Yes, you can hear the rest of the story, can't you? And so that, or a square, I don't know if you ever had a square that had a little cement on it, and that's all it takes to throw it off. The truth for many of us is when we allow sin in our lives, it throws us off. We we have a hard time knowing what God's will is. We have a hard time dealing with our own failures and foibles and mess-ups. For some of us who struggle with hurts and habits, those seem to get worse and we can't figure out why. Well, maybe, just maybe, there's an area of our life where we're saying no to God and our level is off. Repentance is about saying, God, I'm going to agree with you in this area of my life. I'm going to let you bring me back into balance. I'm going to let you show me what the truth is. Listen to what Jesus says here. I love this. Now, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, the background. We don't have this. Herodotus didn't talk about this. But the idea is these guys were sacrificing at the altar and basically the king came in, the the emperor came in and killed them while they were doing something good. And so the general consensus was, well, they must have done something wrong. You ever meet somebody who says, I'm, I've gone through this suffering, I'm going through this trial, I must have done something wrong? Now, I will tell you that sometimes we do suffer because of our own stupidity. Anybody disagree with that? You know, if, if, if I one day say, what does this button do? And then my next words are, hello, Jesus, you'll know... <laughs> that the pastor's own stupidity led to his demise, right? We're hoping that, my wife says, please don't say that. I'm like, well, we're hoping that doesn't happen, but there it is, right? And so at that time, they taught, well, they must have been in sin. But listen to what Jesus says. Listen, I love this. Jesus answered, do you think these Galileans, I love this, were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? So when you go through something and the enemy tells you, well, it's because you're a mess, <laughs> say what Jesus said. Well, do you think I'm a worse mess than those other people? And then Jesus says this, I tell you, no, exclamation point, I love this. And then he says this, Jesus is always refocusing the disciples, always refocusing us. But unless you repent, the word repent means to change your mind. It means for us, it means to agree with God. You know, we think of it as turning around 180. And I told you about the guy who became a Christian and came to me and said, Pastor, I'm turning my life around 360. How about 180? But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Basically, you don't deserve anything good, so repent. Get your life right. Don't worry so much about these. And then he continues, or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, here's what was going on. They were arguing over whether these people were more sinful than other people or if they'd done something wrong and maybe God was punishing them for what they did. And Jesus said, you're worried about questions you can't answer. Why don't you look in the mirror instead? And if we're honest, all of us look at world events. We have way too much access to information now. And we worry about something that we can do nothing about. And Jesus would say, But are you doing today what I've called you to do? Are you being obedient with the people I've called you to love? Do the people around you see God's grace and love in action around you? And then here's the the fruit tree story where the tree looks dead. He's going to cut it down. And this is what the owner says. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. What is this a symbol of? It's a symbol, symbolic of God, listen, giving all of us an opportunity to repent. We've all had that one friend 
who made a bad choice. And all of a sudden they end up in the hospital. Maybe it was drugs, maybe it was alcohol, maybe it was something else. And we, we see them over and over fail and falter. And we pray, God, well, let this be the bottom. Lord, let this be the repentant moment. And over and over, I think God gives us opportunities to repent. And then guess what? We have a choice. And I love it. I absolutely love it when somebody tells me, I'm going to change my life now. I've dealt with this and now I know that God's giving me an opportunity to repent. And I also know that many times they say that to me. And you know what I'm about to say, right? And nothing changes. But I can also point to people who came to me and said, Pastor, God got a hold of me. My life is changing. And I have, over the years, so many years as a pastor, seen radical changes in people's lives. Mean people who God worked their Gossips who instead became gracious. Wow, that's the biggest miracle I've ever seen, by the way. If you've been in a church a long time, you know that's a huge miracle from gossip to grace. Seen people reconcile with their families. And so not only is he showing us this idea of repentance, but he's also showing us grace. And here's what I would say to you. Let's look at this last one. Ask forgiveness and receive grace. Here's what that looks like. Let's say you struggle with a sin in your life. You ask forgiveness. So you say, God, forgive me for that. I'm going to change. Repentance means, God, I don't want to do that anymore. But then I want to encourage you to take the next step, and that is, God, I receive your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Because here's what can happen. You can blow it, you can mess up, and then you can focus on your failure. You can focus on whatever that thing is. The enemy will try to get you focused on And listen, that will actually become selfish and self-centered if you're not careful. So instead you say, and, and by the way, Satan wants you to wallow in your sin. Repentance says, God, you've forgiven me. Lord, thank you for your grace. Now, if you're as old as me, and I know you're not yet, but one day you will be, you can look back, and there are times that in the middle of the night, your evil brain will replay the worst, dumbest thing you've ever done. Tonight in Eric's memories... Tonight in Eric's dreams, we're going to play worst hits of all. Here we go. This is the time you blurted out in front of a thousand people something really stupid. Aren't you enjoying that? Oh, man. This is the time you dropped the cymbals on the stage. Mm. This is the time you spilt that drink and your father made fun of you. Mm. Right? You have those, right? And the enemy will try to keep you there and keep replaying the past. Can I tell you something about the past? All the replays are the same. If you replay it, guess what? You made a mistake, you did something dumb. Guess what? That replay, exactly the same. And then you say, God, thank you for your grace. God, thank you that even in my failures, you can make a difference. Lord, thank you that you forgive stupidity. By the way, I read a thing that said God even figures in your stupidity when he figures out your purpose. Listen to this quote. This is from the guy who's in Chariots of Fire. It's an old movie. Look it up. God's will is only revealed to us step by step. He reveals more as we obey what we know. Surrender means we are prepared to follow God's guidance wherever or however he guides, no matter what the cost. Boy, surrender sounds great when it's somebody else, doesn't it? But what happens when God calls you to surrender an area of your life? Number three, pursuing and knowing Him. If I could get you anywhere today, it would be to this point to say, I want to pursue God's will. I want to know Jesus more. Because here's what I know. As you pursue and get to know God, and you surrender your life to Him, the Bible talks about the fruits of the Spirit, and God multiplies the fruit of the Spirit in your life, which means what? You become more loving you become more joyful. You begin to have peace, even in the middle of difficult circumstances and struggles and things you don't understand. 
You become more patient. I know you hate that one. Every once in a while, somebody will say, I'm not praying for patience. And I'm like, yeah, like God's going to be like, well, I guess I'm not giving that one to you since you didn't pray for it. Kindness. You ever met somebody who's just kind? Gentle. We all need more gentleness, don't we? In our world. Self-control, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. All of those things, God begins to multiply in our lives as we pursue Him. Listen to what it says next. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as He made His way to Jerusalem. Someone asked Him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? The rabbis at that time, by the way, taught that if you were an Israelite, you were saved. Which, if you read even in the Old Testament, that wasn't true. He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you'll stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we went to church, we gave money, we did good things. Close. We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. Basically, we were there when you did these things. Yeah, but he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from me. Away from me, all you evildoers. The way is narrow. Are you pursuing Christ or just want to be close to him? Do you want enough Christianity just so you can feel good about yourself or enough to surrender your life to him? Listen to what Jesus said about himself. Remember earlier I said, listen to Jesus because anybody who rises from the dead has authority. Here's what he says about himself. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. By the way, he could have said, I'm one of the ways. He could have said, I'm one of many ways. He could have said, if you do good works, then you can find the way. No, no, he said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. The way is a person. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. It's about knowing Him. Do you want to be prepared? Then know Him. Do you want to walk through this life with assurance and security? Then have peace knowing Him. When you're ready, you don't have to fear. You don't have to walk in being afraid. When you surrendered your life to Him, you don't have to think, well, what's going to happen next? One day... Uh, there will be a day where I will no longer be here on this earth. And on that day, you can say, I know from everything that Eric said that he is with Christ. Why? Because he surrendered his life to him. Yeah, but I know Eric. He didn't have his act together. Yeah. That should, listen, my stories should show you that grace is real. I mean, people get to know me. They come to group. They come the first week. Oh, that Eric, he's so spiritual. He's such a good Christian. A month later, they're like, who put him in charge of this church? What in the world? We... I'm not even sure he drives like a Christian. By the way, I ordered a new bumper sticker. Can I tell you about it? If you're reading it, it the top is backwards, and it says, don't choke anyone. And then under it, it says, I know it's backwards. It's for me. Can't wait till it gets here. Here's your final encouragement. That has nothing to do with the sermon. I just see this is why you all need grace too. It's okay. All right. I want to encourage you to follow by surrendering to God's word. You want to know about God? Read his word. You want to know about Jesus? Surrender to his word. You want to fall more in love with him? Learn more about him. Learn, learn who he is. As you discover who he is, as you get to know him, what happens? You fall more in love with him. As you fall more in love with him, you know what happens? Obedience becomes more natural. When you, when you falter and you fail, you understand his love for you, and so you surrender that area back to him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to be ready for eternity. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means. The fact that Jesus died on a cross, why did he do that? The fact that we're all messed up and we're all broken and we need His grace. So today you can receive His grace, surrender your life to Him and say, Jesus, I want to follow you the rest of my life. So that when you get to heaven, your answer to why should I let you in is, well, I know Jesus. Not just about Him, but I surrendered my life to Him. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you.
you're here today and you're a Christian and there's an area of your life that God put his finger on while we were talking today, just surrender it back to him. That's what repentance is. Just agree with him on it and say, God, I'm going to follow through even when it's hard. Would you join me as we pray this morning? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you that you walk and use so many people at our church. But Lord, we all know it's about you and we want it to always be about you and not about us. So we surrender every area to you today. Lord, thank you for this time together. Bless each one in Jesus' name.